also the owner of the lovely venue that we're sitting in tonight, and uh, just delve in, because you tend not to do a lot of these, I feel like. You don't do a lot of, not not a lot of Q&As, and so a lot of people don't know your story. But when Ebony asks you, you say yes. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So... um, so yeah, I mean, you were, like you, you were just joking that we did a pre-interview and then we ended up just doing what we do, which is to shoot the crap about a lot of different things <laughs> instead of actually talk about what we we're supposed to talk about. So um, can you just, like one of the things I don't know I ever caught in anything you've ever done was that you were in a band. True. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I was reading that you were saying while you were in this that you're a guitarist, right? Rock band, Jade. Guitarist in a rock band called Jade. Look at you and your research. Yeah, yeah I, I got something though. What age was that? Wait, how old were oh, you? Oh, I was uh, 15. Oh, wow. Yeah. So early days. And I, I saw a quote that said that you quickly figured out that if the artists didn't get their business straight, the whole thing would go to high hell. Did you figure that out like in your early teens as well? Oh, yeah. We were trying to... Uh, book ourselves and it was an all girl band and we are either in high school or just out of high school trying to figure things out uh, got ripped off a few times and realized that one of us had to put up our hand and go okay we gotta learn the business side and uh, that was me and did you just literally do it by trial and error or what did you because you guys were young at that time I actually went to um uh, I was in the States initially, and then I came up and went to Humber College in the, yeah, <laughs> alumni, um, and uh, took some of the music courses and then went full-time into uh, business marketing, uh, just to get, instead of going to university, I didn't want to take, you know, the four full four years to get an MBA, I just wanted to get the brass tax. And it was a really good experience for me. And when I came out, I realized I was going to be a much better business person than a guitar player. Uh, so that's. Uh, so were you doing the band all through that? Sorry? Were you still in the band? And- still in a band. Uh, up here, different girls, still an all girl band, which, you know, was a little bit of, more of a rarity back then. Right. So, uh, look, we still got ripped off <laughs> on a regular basis, but at least I saw it coming. <laughs> right. So then how did you make the leap? So you're in marketing, and then you, how did you make the leap into the actual, you know, traditional, so-called traditional music business? Uh, well, my very first job at a record label was as receptionist. Um, I had no idea how to type. I actually, it was a receptionist for a, an entertainment law firm slash label. So, didn't know how to type, uh, didn't really know how to answer the phones. <laughs> uh, was actually called in within about two weeks uh, uh, to the office manager's office and she said, you don't really know what you're doing. It's like, no, but I'm like, I'm super smart and I'll stay here as long as it takes to, to, to figure it out. Figure it out. And uh, I was one day sort of handed a project that, that one of the senior people at the firm wanted like a review on, I can't even remember the book. Um, so I wanted me to pick it up and do a short review. Well, I went home, I read the entire book and like gave him a dissertation that was like 24 pages long the next day I went here. Um, and you know, ever since then I, I kind of, uh, when people kind of ask for advice, it's like, okay, make sure um, when you have the opportunity to show up, you show up because no one's necessarily going to look at you and go, well, that receptionist definitely has it going on. Um, you know, you have to find the opportunities to, to... To shine. To shine, yeah. And then how did you get over to... So was BMG your first actual marketing gig? Um, like a label situation? Well, this was... This label law firm, who probably should remain nameless because they, uh, bad story. <laughs> I think you might remember the story, but I won't bore the rest of you. Uh, so after that, uh, I moved on to another independent label called Alert. We had Holly Cole, Kim Mitchell, Men Without Hats. Um, it was uh, myself and my beautiful daughter's uh, dad that actually ran it with a partner in Montreal. 
Uh, from then, I w from there, I was headhunted to Sony, and at the time, I was like all about the independent business. Uh, there was no way I was going to go to the big corporate cow. Um, but uh, having mortgaged my house twice in order to keep my company going, uh, ended up at Sony. Uh, moved from Sony to EMI, then EMI to BMG, and then BMG and Sony merged. So I ended up. Well, you're missing. Head. You're missing a kind of important piece in between there. You oh, were right. at BMG, and while at BMG, became the head of BMG. Correct. Uh, at the time, title was president. I'm assuming. Yep. Right. So you became the first female to head, first woman to head a major label in this country. Um, sure. Thank you. At that point. Did you, when you were there, did you suffer from imposter syndrome? When you kind of got, because you're not the kind of, you're not a shrinking violet. You know, neither of us are a shrinking violet. We always, you know, we always get, me, you, and Peggy seem to get like carted into the same <laughs> bucket. We're not shrinking violets. But did you, um, having come through the ranks at BMG, did you, did you ever have imposter syndrome about I shouldn't be here because you're like the first to do it? Um, you know, it's funny when you're when you're in a position like that, you're a little bit too busy to have imposter syndrome, right? Your head's just down all the time, and then you look up. And I remember when I was uh, offered to take over the company because Paul Alofs at the time was going down to LA, LA and yeah. I remember Paul to uh, run um, Disney retail and uh, Strauss Zelnick, the global CEO. CEO at the time uh, came up and offered me the position and all I can remember thinking is, okay, it's the devil I know or the devil I don't and I happen in this scenario to be the devil I know right. <laughs> because ultimately what could have happened is somebody was going to parachute in to do the job and it was going to be insufferable. <laughs> so right. uh, it was kind of by default. A little bit of, you know, it, it, it definitely was a little bit of imposter syndrome off the top because you're looking around and, and, you know, at the time it was really only me and I'm like, okay, how am I going to handle this? My daughter was really young at the time, largely brought her up as a single mom. So it was more about, like, how am I going to manage the personal in terms of being able to do it. I wasn't, um, the one thing about working with a small independent company is you kind of learn the ropes. You kind of learn a little bit about everything. So I wasn't afraid to take on the job because I, you know, I had delved into a little bit of publishing and business affairs and all the rest of it. I was afraid that, you know, how was I going to do as a mom in all this? I think right. was my... Biggest and how was the rest of the industry when you took over that position with you? How were they what? How were, what was the rest of the industry with you? Um, that's an inter interesting question. <laughs> well, I mean, how, I, I, how were they I with know you? What, <laughs> that's why I asked the question. I, mean, I, I basically know the answer, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, well, I think the bit of advice I always give people is you really because um, if the, to be honest, if there was no you, there really wouldn't have even been a me or a Pat or you know what I mean. So no. like, Thank I, you. you know, I I think that is it is what it is. So well, that's the ultimate form of flattery. Thank you. Um, I you know early on I talked myself into believing, and I do actually think it's mostly true uh, that the best thing that can ever happen to you in business is that people underestimate you. And if, you know, they're underestimating you because the fact that you're a woman or you're a new immigrant or whatever it may be, it immediately gives you a competitive advantage. Um, and so throughout my entire career, always had to stay observant because sometimes it'd be like, they aren't really hitting on me, are they? <laughs> they aren't really sort of dismissing me, are they? And then you have to take a couple seconds and digest it and go, okay, they are, and that's okay, um, but I'm gonna turn the conversation around right now. And that was sort of how I got through the early days. And, you know, frankly, it's not like it stopped either entirely. It's certainly better, but, you know. And not. you were well known, I mean, maybe back then, maybe not so much with 
the younger artists right now, but you gave a lot of um, freedom and chances to your staff at the time mm -hmm. to try new things in different ways, um, especially where it came to so-called urban music, black music specifically, whether it was signing certain things or green lighting certain projects, you know, um, you know, whether it was us out in the middle of the night with your troops stickering things we shouldn't have been stickering and being very, being very renegade in our marketing tools in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, you, you always seem to be supportive of that. And this, that sort of seems to harken back to your, your um, independent days. So was that super important to you when it came to the, your signing strategy for artists? And what was your strategy? And, and you're still obviously booking artists into this venue and your other venues, so you're still curating artists to this day. So what were you looking for then? What are you looking for now? Well, in terms of, of uh, I was not the person necessarily directly signing um, the artists. They were coming through an A&R department, coming through uh, marketing people. They'd be coming through the street team. So kudos to all of them because I do believe in, you know, shared leadership in terms of... Uh, but you let them do it. Like, you, you no, still for sure, for gave sure. them the and, go ahead. And I think, you know, back then when I took over BMG, it was a country label. And I hated country music. Like, I still hate country music. I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Um, but... The reality for me was, you know, at that time there was so much going on. We had, you know, Bad Boy, we had La Face, we had, you know, everything that was happening in urban music at the time. And I'm, wa you know, and it's great music, and I'm watching everything blow up in America, and here it'd be like 2% of the US sales. And I think what shocked the universe, and I realize I'm talking to like a younger room, but some of you will. Uh, uh, understand the context is so we put out a Wu Tang Clan record. And at that point, I knew Wu Tang was like, okay, come on, this isn't just black music anymore. Like all the shredder kids, everybody's listening to Wu Tang. And that's when we got in trouble with the police when we stickered all of you on the street. <laughs> but uh, the record debuts number one on the charts, and everybody was like, what's a Wu Tang? Um, so it was. You know, it was sort of the, the first real, like, ding. There's, you know, this audience is here. We're just not working hard enough to get to them. And we can't assume that, you know, urban music is only going to sell to 2% of our population. We have to, like, work harder. So, you know, building the street team and, and, you know, engaging further in marketing and spending money and getting more of the artists up here. Um, started to affect the change and you know kind of behind all that momentum was you know signing artists like the rascals and ghetto concept and i sort of feel like in this room i might as well be talking about frank sinatra <laughs> <laughs> and keisha <laughs> fred astaire um <laughs> And Keisha but, Shante. And, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It was, you know, it was a good time um, to to kind of use that momentum to uh, build uh, local uh, urban music as well. So um, there was so much out there, and it was, you know, this is early days for Julie ba Black and Socrates and um, uh, Jellystone and everybody was getting the big US deal and then nothing would happen because that's when everybody was just signing everybody and seeing if it would stick against the wall. Um, but it certainly uh, showed me how much talent there was up here that was really raw and really authentic because there was no money or support behind them, right? Like these were kids that you'd sometimes like find on the street that were just rapping, it's like, oh my God, where did you come from? Yes. So, um, but it was, you know, it was very much a team effort. Certainly, uh, you know, I'd be out a lot um, at the clubs, mostly, you know, following up on stuff that 
Click or Saw Guy or you know whoever was doing the job at the time were like, no, you really got to check this out. And I love the music, so that and made it easier. If you bring that to today, like when you're thinking about it from a venue perspective and still curating what you're doing and you guys are doing, still doing quite a bit of it yourself. Like, what are you looking for now? Like, if you're looking and talking to new artists, trying to break in, right. trying to break into their live business, what are you talking to, what are you saying to them when they're asking, like, how do I break in? Right. Um, well, obviously we're coming from a different perspective because we have two venues, uh, Phoenix here and a venue called Bronson Center Music Theater in Ottawa. Um, and same thing, there's, there's a team here that again uh, are, you know, out there listening, um, giving suggestions of, you know, if you check this out. Uh, because of this size of venue, a lot of acts that are coming through here are part of major tours with Live Nation or collective concerts. Um, but we're probably our third biggest promoter in terms of the number of shows we do. And, and uh, we will, or we talk directly with Jonathan Ramos, who's Rap Season, who's the big urban promoter here and people will say look have you uh, you know heard the internet or you know have you like just sort of letting me know what's going on musically not just locally but also internationally um, and we are probably known I would say as the the most active urban room in terms of our size and that's an uh, issue in Toronto, it seems, for the last little while about people finding venues and spaces for urban music and um, really struggling, you know, to, to make certain things, certain nights stick. Why have you decided it's fine to take a chance on it? Well, I wouldn't say we take a chance on um, No, I don't think so either, but that's how I'm sure they look at it. You know, uh, Ray, one of our managers here, I don't know if he's in the room, um, also overseas security and there's you know sadly there's just a reality to Toronto that everything does have to get vetted uh, you know where we're actually told by guns and gangs that you can't put that show together because of, and a bunch of times it's not even the artists themselves but it's the crowd that's going to come out that might be from competing gangs like this sadly that's stuff that we have to think about and the the labels signing these artists um, know this uh, Pressa who's like has the you know does the European tour in front of Drake can't actually play in the city of Toronto because it's too dangerous for him and the audience right so uh, that's always in consideration for the live side um, Certainly, that doesn't apply to everybody, and we do uh, a lot of urban shows that are great. Uh, we just, you know, it's it's something we have to be mindful of. Sadly, I think more so now than before. Uh, but you know, and and I will say this: with the advent of uh, of streaming, we also see a lot of urban artists that come through here. Uh, Anders comes to mind, where he had just had one, one song, song out. I was here, yeah. And he sold out this room in like five minutes. And I'm thinking, how good can he possibly be live if he's like got one song and he's never, he did that without ever playing live. Now, I thought he did a really good job yeah, that it wasn't night, bad. but it's it was like a that's night. a huge amount of pressure, um, you know, on an artist to sort of fill a 1300 cap room on their very first show. Outing. Um, and, but it is a phenomenon, certainly since the pandemic, because you know, we're seeing a ton of acts that are coming forward and kind of saying, you know, love to play the room. I've got like three million streams. It's like, ever played live? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anybody who's an artist out there, I definitely suggest wherever you can rehearse safely before you get up on a stage, you should do so because Ultimately, you know, in this day and age, with streaming, your number one um, stream of income is going to be live 
performance and you want to make sure that you have your chops ready to get on Yeah, because it's also hard to come back from that. Like if Anders had done that show, which was a pretty splashy show, it was ram-packed in here. Mm -hmm. And if he had come up and bombed, irrespective of the streams, the reality is social media does live to Ebony's point earlier yeah. and that would have been everywhere. Yeah. And that would not have been great for yeah, his live no. business. Yeah, I think everybody thinks that the new streaming world is the holy grail because everybody, you know, has an audience and everybody can break and everybody can, you know, shine through. And but you've got to remember the downside of that is like everything, including us right now. Um, sorry, Pressa. <laughs> Everything, including us right now, is being taped and online and on a phone. And, you know, uh, if you're not ready for prime time, it's a little bit too late. So you really have to kind of plan strategically when, you know, which kind of audiences you get in front of and how quickly you decide to get on a stage because it now sort of is pictured forever Forever. on YouTube. I want to go back to come forward because I, I know Ebony wants to make sure we have enough time for questions which is you after BMG it merged with Sony um, you did that for a while and had to helm some difficult times during the business where you had to merge and let go of people and come up with different strategies and all that kind of stuff and when you finally left the label business so to speak you went into War Child and um, that's something you had been involved in on the label side already and supportive of, which is why you went that way. And at the same time you were doing, you still had your marketing company and you were working with, with artists. What was the focus of that? And did you kind of go back to your roots where you were like, I really want to you know, like develop things from the grassroots marketing perspective, artists and marketing perspective? Um, great question. I think Vivian should have her own talk show. <laughs> <laughs> She's like better researched on me than I am. Um, the so Warchild was a charity that actually started up by two filmmakers uh, in uh, the Netherlands, and it just sort of became a a charity that musicians and artists gravitated to. So David Bowie, Brian Eno, Paul McCartney. Everyone knows those names, right? <laughs> um, were were patrons of this charity, and it, and the, the two doctors that started it here came with sort of the same concept, concept and mandate that you know let's use that as a form of visibility, fundraising, even programming. You know, we went to Sierra Leone and and built a recording studio from scratch for you know kids in Sierra Leone because largely you're dealing with Ill illiteracy in that market and so being able to communicate through music, through radio was a key part of, of getting messaging out to young people. So um, it was sort of a, a natural uh, evolution for me at the time. Uh, it happened on top of us uh, starting Sound Academy, which was the old docks before it became Rebel Night, Nightclub. And uh, I, I actually ended up becoming CEO of War Child North America. I, I really intended to step in for Eric Hoskins, um, who was running for political office at the time, and none of us thought he was going to win. <laughs> So it was supposed to be like, well, when you're actually running for office, you're not supposed to work a job. So I was like, okay, I'll fill in for two months. And then he won, and it became three uh, amazing years of my life, and I traveled through Africa and Afghanistan, Haiti. Um, and, you know, at the time, I really put together the importance of what we do. And I know you've been part of projects, too, where it's like, hey, we're so fortunate to, you know, be involved in music for a living. Um, you know, it's I always say, like, you know, one day I'm going to go out and get a real job. Uh, but when you actually put it together and see the holistic importance of music, uh, you realize that, wow, we, we have so much power um, to connect all over the world with young people 
on really important issues. And, and that doesn't mean that music always has to be heavy handed with a message. Um, it'd be nice if there was a little bit more messaging in music today because I think it's sorely needed. But in terms of engaging young people in you know, the context of something they understand, going back to Sierra Leone, we go over and we, we build the studio and a bunch of people are over there that, that uh, you know, Ivan Berry was one of them. And uh, at the time, um, not to go off track, but Sierra Leone have been through a civil war. And uh, if any of you saw the movie Blood Diamond, you would know that uh, it was based on uh, diamond mining and uh, the party would cut off people's hands because the competing party was, uh, the uh, campaign was the future is in your hands, so they would get their hands cut off if they were showing support for the party. Like it was a really fucked up, sorry, situation. Um, and at the same time, uh, there was this small local group of kids Western Africa, everybody wants to be a rapper, everybody wants, you know, everybody's listening to all the music that, you know, kids over here are listening to. And one of them wrote a song that was about the importance of voting uh, and civic responsibility and getting out to the polls for the next election to change things. And because it's largely an illiterate country, there's 43 radio stations in the country of Sierra Leone. And this one song was seen as uh, the, a big part of the mobilization of young people to change the outcome of the election. So, you know, when you bring it down to something as real as that, it's like, wow, we have a lot of individual and collective power here, and it's something that we should be thinking about in our everyday, uh, privileged situation to be able to work in the music business and be um, a mouthpiece to young people. Right. And, and after War Child, um, obviously you're already in the venue business at that point. You're doing your marketing company. And fast forward and now you're here. And if I'm not mistaken, you being involved with either Sound Academy and Phoenix, doesn't that, didn't that make you one of the first women to own a venue? Uh, is Athena here? I th there's Athena. This is Athena. Who no, we know. We love Athena. She owns the opera house. She does. So we love her. She's the, the queen. She's the and grand then I think there's a few people here that are also on the, the venue side as well. Um, so... No, I don't. She, yeah, she's the one. I think you're probably takes, yes. Sorry, I think she Athena. takes that on. You, you take that. You take that <laughs> cake first. We should actually have a chat with Athena at some point because uh, I don't think we've ever had one of these kind of things with Athena. You've seen stuff that, oh, okay. <laughs> like, wow, the things you've probably seen. No, there's uh, Rebecca Jenkins, Rebecca Campbell. There's a so lot you, of so women you guys on the live network? side that are doing some really. So do you great guys things. have a network amongst yourselves? Because you know, sometimes I feel like in ev the reason why I'm asking the question is because I feel like in every part of the business, at some point, all the women feel like they need to gather and like have like a woo saw moment. So do you guys have like a women in live music sort of woo saw group chat kind of thing going on? Um, well, it's not specifically women, but certainly since the pandemic, we created this group called Love You Live, which is uh, around 27 Toronto venues, just to, whilst we're competitors, we have a whole bunch of similar issues with the pandemic, so, uh, you know, we every couple of weeks do uh, get together and talk collectively. Um, probably one of the few good outcomes of the pandemic is, you know, it did sort of create more of that open conversation. I think otherwise, um, you know, I think we're all working nights, so there's not really that much opportunity to get together. But, you know, and I don't think I've seen Athena or anybody else in that group other than from here up on a Zoom call in some time. So, uh, you know, that's sort of how we've been 
meeting, but I think, you know, it's, look, it's been super tough on the live side, and... Yeah, I was just I about to say, let's, let's, let's talk about that real quick. I mean, we obviously know you and I can talk about the pandemic and the effect on music um, for a long time. We did the other day, but um, what... I mean, I know you're hopeful for, you know, positive change and us getting back to... Um, to, to music and, and having a more regular, normal experience in your venues. Um, what, what, what is your thought now with like, the, as it stands today with the concept that there may be vaccine passports coming that you guys can use in live music. W what do you see, where do you see us going right now? And, and specifically, how does that even work for, because especially thinking about our audience, newer artists who before had so many places sort of that they could go to and fit in and start their thing, like with, the, with us going into a regimented world where you guys are gonna need a period of building to get back to where you were, are people going to be taking chances on brand new artists, et cetera? Well, you know, it's interesting. We just uh, had uh, an event uh, two Fridays ago and I, uh, I called, and it wasn't an, an urban show, it wasn't, it was actually a group called Good Enough Karaoke, which is live karaoke. And Tim McCready, who does live karaoke, has been around the city forever, but he said to me, you know, uh, I actually called him and I said, you know, you've been calling me forever saying, and we've talked about the fact that this venue is just, too big for you to play, except now we just got smaller because we can only, the way this is set up right now, uh, we can only operate to 200 people and we have the capacity for 1,300, which is, you know, um, obviously not a great uh, economic exercise, but in terms of being able to get people back to work, um, we suddenly are a better venue for artists that are smaller. And, you know, we've had, we did a, a streaming series called April After Hours with Flo 93.5. Yeah, we were here. And Jam was involved. Yeah, it was like, and I saw artists like Just John perform, and I was blown away. I thought they were so great. Yeah, I was here and, during the taping of our segment, and I have to say, like, all the women that were here and showed up really just gave it their all. They did a show like this room was full. Mm -hmm. There was no... Nobody skipped a beat, and it, you know you wouldn't have known that there was like four of us standing here watching. Right, that. but you know you saw the talent too, and when you look at putting you know four or five of those artists together, they may not have a live following yet, but they were all so great that now is probably a better time to sort of build from that in terms of numbers because you get to 1,300 people at a certain point, and it's sort of like okay, that's really big. But this is an excellent time to be, you know, showcasing music because we're sort of like a small club and a big club at so the moment. It, what, what do you suggest then for, because obviously like we talked about, like you're probably your third biggest booker for your own room. Do, knowing how hard it is sometimes for a brand new artist to get an agent, like a live agent, what would you suggest? Do you, do you guys that are doing a lot of booking yourself accept people sending stuff to you and reaching out to your booking people directly or what would you suggest? Oh. If they, especially if they don't have an agent. Yeah, and look, if you're brand new, it's gonna be pretty tough to get an agent, although never say never because I, you know, a lot of artists have. Um, there's two things I almost always recommend for new artists getting in the game. Uh, one is volunteerism and you know honey jam is a good example of that that you know you need to network you can't just pick up the phone and expect that you know Denise Ross from Live Nation can take your call because she's like you know booking hundreds of acts um, you know but if you get to I don't know if Denise is here is Denise here I don't know if she meant it um, you know you have a networking session here. These kind of opportunities are key. And uh, it's great that Honey Jam do these on a regular basis. But there are you know, other things you can do. You can volunteer for Honey Jam. You can vol volunteer for Unison Benevolent Fund, which is one of the big charities in the industry that helps uh, musicians or people in the music industry in crisis. 
Um, people will never say no to you if you're actually volunteering your time to help out. I find that that's a much easier call to make than, hey, will you book my band? And then, you know, you get front and center with people like Vivian, who's one of the biggest publishers in the country, and once you've actually helped Vivian out, she's going to be much more inclined, and this is just human nature, to maybe take your tape, because you just spent the evening helping, you know, Vivian out on an event. Um, and so the volunteerism and, you know, just the networking communication is of critical importance. It really isn't that hard. Um, it's not about just getting in people's faces and, and being annoying. Um, but, you know, there are events like this happening in this city all the time. Uh, and there will, if you're persistent, polite, but persistent, um, you'll eventually get to um, the people that really need to get to, to see about potential uh, opening act opportunities um, or even working within the business. Uh, to answer your question, yes, we, you know, we have booked people on the basis of saying, hey, do you need an opening act for, you know, an event we're doing in Ottawa, and we happen to need an opening act, and it sounds pretty good, and so, yeah, that does happen. But don't have the expectation that those things are going to happen all the time, because you're dealing with some of the busiest people in the music business and you just have to be respectful of their situation, their time. They're not being rude by not responding to you. They just have no headroom in terms of the work that they have to get done in their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, I think I want to try and open up for some questions. Are, how are we doing that down here? Do um, we have a mic? We're, we're, yeah, we're right here. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. We're more than halfway through. Anyone who has a question, please come here in this uh, line. And we're gonna start with, and say your name, please, when you come. Hi, Lisa. My name Hi. is Sakako. And I was wondering if you had any advice for when uh, you're negotiating certain business deals or advocating for yourself in a space, in a business setting where an artist like me might feel a little bit alien to, um, just in that, like, how do you take up space in that space? That's a really good question. Um, I'm, I consider myself a good negotiator, except when it comes to me. <laughs> Um, if I have to negotiate my own deal, it, it, like suddenly the people we value the least in the room is ourselves. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I have always uh, defaulted to get somebody else to do that negotiation because I am, you know, more likely to undervalue myself. And obviously as a, a young artist, that becomes uh, pretty difficult because getting somebody to work for you, probably, unless you have a great friend that's in entertainment law, um, you don't necessarily uh, have the opportunity to do that. So, you know, it, it, the there are a number of books, uh, including. Does anybody remember Don? The name of Don Passman's book. Yeah, still read it. What is it? The Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business. Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business by Don Passman, and there's actually a Canadian version by. Um, a good friend of mine, Chip Sutherland, who manages Feist. Um, those kind of tools are really valuable to read through because you're not going to be able to negotiate unless you understand deeply uh, the terms of the contract, right? Um, contracts are a little more straightforward now than they used to be. I think when I got in the business, they were 75 pages long. <laughs> Um, they've, they've thankfully come down quite a bit, you know, where that stuff's concerned. But I also think, like, your other advice about networking, you know, we're, we've always been a business, even though we're so informal, we've always been a business that sometimes doesn't share info well, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's finally started, especially amongst women, to share more info. So I always say, you know, make your own network. You guys, you already know, you have your network of artists that you deal with. It just be um, radically honest with each other about what's going on. You're at the point right now where 
there's nothing to lose to be open about what people are booking you for and how much and you know the terms that you're you're getting right now i think that's the biggest gift you guys could give each other in whatever sisterhood you're in is to just you know ask those questions and for the people that are being asked try to answer it in the best way you can because that's knowledge is power right. at the end of the day absolutely um and when I talk about the book, it's more about understanding the context of what a recording agreement looks like, what a publishing agreement looks like, what is SOCAN, what it, you know, you need to have the brass tacks uh, yourself because you can't entirely rely uh, on your network. Um, and then in terms of the negotiation, you're just going to have to step aside and think of yourself as a product as opposed to the artist because you need, if you're gonna be a shrewd negotiator, you can't get emotional about it and it's almost impossible to not get emotional about your music because if you didn't, you shouldn't be an artist. You're supposed to be that emotional and passionate. Um, so if you can't get somebody else to do it or to Vivian's point, you don't have the network and you're in a position to do it yourself, know your shit. Uh, know what an agreement looks like, make sure you, you know, if you can find somebody to help you take you through those terms that you do so, and then separate yourself from your music and think about, you know, that you're selling a product and distance yourself because the one thing you can't do at the negotiation table is cry. <laughs> I learned that one. <laughs> Hi, my name's Hi. Sarah. Thank you for your time, Lisa. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for artists who are also songwriters and how we can get our songs picked up by other artists if we're just starting out. Well, we have the uh, queen of publishing right here, so I'm going to uh, deflect. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, this is a longer, longer story. Um, I, I was talking about this in our Publishing 101 thing we did couple weeks back, which is that there are a lot of artists that also write for other people, and um, the attitude taken often is like, I wrote this song, it's not for me, I think it's for somebody else. And so it, they almost deal with it like a bit of a throwaway, and if you don't want to do it, why would you think someone else wants to do it? And so you have to kind of change the attitude about those songs that don't fit your aesthetic and that you think belong to other people and then really gear it to go to those people and then it's about network building if you think your songs are appropriate for artist a rihanna whoever um, go look at her credits go look to see who's writing those songs currently go see who the producers are go see who the publishers are go and do your research and then you start hitting up those people. 99% of the time where it comes to those kind of things, it comes down to a connection with existing network within a specific artist. And then you really write the song with that person in mind. You cannot send a rock demo to a country artist. A publisher will see behind the lines and we'll be like, oh, okay, I can see where you're going. I know our friend likes to say production denotes genre. Um, a good song is just lyric and melody at the end of the day. It can be produced however you want to produce it. But the reality is in certain genres, they need to hear it in that way. So if you're meaning it to go to a woman, do not put a male vocal on there. Put a female vocal, make it sound almost exactly the way it needs to sound. You know, demos today for other artists, the stuff that we get is not a demo. It's literally done. They literally just take off the demo vocal and add the artist vocal to it. Half the time, the demo vocal ends up being the background vocal. So there's not a lot of work being done. So you really have to tailor it to who it is you specifically want to, um, to reach and not just think of your throwaway tracks. Like if you have a track that you just genuinely don't think is yours, cool. Think of who it's for and then rework it. Constantly rework it. Always be open to having that artist, especially if they're known as a writer, to be writing on it. So don't sell them a full song. Send them a chorus and a verse so they have something to add, so they have some ownership in there. If you send them a full song, very few are gonna record a whole song as is in today's world. So that's, I mean, I'll be around after so we can talk more if anything. 
Hi, um, before I introduce myself, I just want to say thank you to Honey Jam and the both of you for the conversation. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's been very insightful listening to your experiences in the music industry. Um, but my name is Brogan McNeil. I'm an aspiring uh, music video director, and I'm currently a concert slash musician photographer. And my question is for Lisa. I was wondering um, if you could give me any advice on how I can break out more into the concert photography scene, because right now I'm emailing a lot of people to try to shoot artists, um, but I'm not really getting a lot of replies, which I understand, but I was just wondering if you have any other avenues that I could approach. Thank you. Well, part of that is because there are no concerts, so <laughs> don't get yourself too down. <laughs> we will be back. Um, and, and you know what, that's a really good point, because we, we get a ton of requests for people that say, hey, I want to come shoot Soccer Money Mummy or DFA, whatever. And oftentimes it comes off as a fan looking for a photo pass so they can get into the show as opposed to somebody that genuinely, you know, wants to make this a career. Um, most of us on this side of the business know a great live shot when we see it. So the best calling card you can have if you find a show or, you know, maybe it's not, um, you know, a, a, a headline act because that, you know, there's lots of hoops that even the promoter has to go through with that act. They might only have a limited number of photo passes. They have to all be accredited with major publications and that kind of thing. But if you set your sights to look, I want to come and shoot your band at a smaller venue, or I want to come and shoot the opening act only, I don't need to stay for the headliner, and you have some amazing shots, people will react to that. So, you know, think about building your portfolio, because if I'm looking at a great shot, it doesn't have to be a great shot of Billie Eilish, right? It can be, you know, all kinds of artists, it just sort of you know, if I know the artist and I see something that really captures the essence, that's what, that's what's going to work for me. And I'll, you know, I think hone your talent and really focus on that. And then as you do start to outreach, um, oftentimes it's not the venue that will necessarily make the decision on um, photo passes. Uh, it, you know, it has to go to the promoter. It might even have to go to the manager. Um, but... There are, you know, anybody's going to react to, wow, these shots are amazing. And on your way out, there's some images go that way. You'll see some images on the wall of the type of images that are like, you know, just were phenomenal and we paid to put them on the wall for that reason. Um, so that would be my suggestion. And, you know, also back to the networking comment, um, there are other artists here that probably really could use a photographer, um, you know, whether it's just live or it's in studio for promo shots. And they might not have a budget right now, but uh, it's one way to build your uh, por portfolio. And if you nail those shots, I don't care if it's not Beyonce, <laughs> right? I just, I want to see an amazing shot. And I think you'd be surprised how people will respond to that. Hello, Lisa. My Hi. name is Holly Clausius. Hi. I'm uh, one of the Honey Jam artists from this year. Um, Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, my question had to do with marketing a little bit. So you mentioned the artists that played here that had about three million streams or whatever and no performance experience. For the opposite side of things, if you have a lot of performance experience and maybe like a smaller dedicated fan base, what are some tips for maybe expanding that online presence and those streams? Right. Um, Vivian and I are going to sound like one trick ponies here, but you know, going to go back to that networking word. Um, my guess is there's probably half a dozen people in here that are really uh, adept at uh, social media. Um, and this is, you know, Honey Jam is uh, sisterhood 20 years in or 25? 25. 25. 26. Sorry. I know it's because you look 25, Ebony, that it just throws me. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, it's, you know, look, it's a skill I don't have. I hire people to do social media because I don't live in it and... Uh, I know what I want to communicate. I know what kind of content I want to see. 
um, but I wouldn't consider myself a specialist, so it's always something that I bring in. But, you know, you guys all have tradable skills, so, you know, make sure that you recognize that you do have some cachet. There are artists in here that need a photographer. Uh, there are social media people that are trying to get further into the business that if they can show examples of two or three new up and coming artists that they took, you know, their socials up by, you know, they're built their community by 150%. Like those, those are cashable uh, opportunities to trade. And so, you know, I'd be really surprised that you don't know some people within your uh, milieu that, or even in this room that can't, you, can't uh, help you out in that regard. And in the meantime, you know, I would suggest um, keep your content fresh. Uh, be, think about what you're gonna say, like map it out, right? Because, you know, people like me that are getting barraged by social media and I'm just not on all social media all the time. If somebody's like hitting me with the same image over and over again, if I keep getting the same message, I will tune it out. And what, one of the ways we manage our social media calendars is quite literally as a calendar. You as a product, here is the month of October, what's your message, what are the images that are gonna support that message, when are you gonna post, where are you gonna post? Um, you have to think about yourself you know, like you are marketing your product. And that is much more than just going, hey, I'm gonna just, you know, I post this shot last month, I'm gonna post it again. It's not interesting, uh, you know, artists that constantly do their, you know, selfie headshot over and over and over again. You know, it's like, I guess that might work for Olivia Rodrigo and some of those artists, but, I know from my vantage point on social media, I want to get to know the person and you have the opportunity of, of giving people your true story and showing your true self and never forgetting that, you know, what you're marketing is your music. So I don't want to see somebody's like vacation shots on their social media, uh, uh, you know, you need to make sure that your marketing as an artist is kept separate and that your music plays a key role in it on a regular basis because I already know that you've won Honey Jam and that's a story. I already know you're really pretty. I haven't heard your music. So, you know, if you're trying to get to me or someone like me, then obviously music has to play a key part in that uh, calendar. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a full, completed, produced song. You know, you've, we've seen, we're now seeing artists blow up on TikTok with 20 seconds of a vocal of a cover song, and next thing you know, it's like some kid in Australia is being signed to a global deal with Sony. So, you know, it's, it's within reach, but don't for a second think that th the things that happen virally aren't really thought through and planned out. Yeah, it's not um, very viral. It, it's, it's, it's very planned. It's very planned. Yeah, like, you know, every post of Olivia Rodrigo is probably, you know, looked at by a dozen people that, you know, argue if it should be left side or right side. So, um, you now have to do a little bit of, of that yourself. Hi, um, thank you so much for answering our questions. Um, my name is Yasmin Shelton, and I'm wondering for emerging musicians new to negotiating, how do you balance seizing the moment and taking opportunities and getting that exposure with advocating for yourself as somebody that has financial value? Like, when do you pick those moments and, like, what would be a couple of things you would consider or that would push you to lean one way or another? Like, when do right. you take that risk? Um, it's a really good question. And, and when you're done that, I'd like to tag on to, because I know how it feels, how it plays out on our side of the business, but I'm interested in how it plays out in the live side for them, the doing the show for promo free versus getting money. And right, and, and are you talking about live here, or are you talking about on the label side? I'm talking, I think both, because you have both sides right. of that experience. Yeah, um, you know, I often say that musicians are some of the most generous people on the planet, and that is true because anytime uh, we do a fundraiser here, um, 
there's always artists coming to the forefront that are prepared to play for free. We like to reciprocate that when we can. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there's always like just a genuine generosity, I think, amongst artists because, you know, historically they're not, uh, if, if they valued money more than art, they wouldn't be artists. Um, so I think, you know, from your vantage point, um, well, f free has to come with an opportunity. Um, if you're going to get on this stage and you're going to, you know, play in front of uh, Death From Above and it's a sold out show, they should be able to pay you. And that conversation needs to happen about, look, you know, just to get my, you know, to pay my musicians, whatever, that conversation should happen because I think people do sometimes take advantage. Um, in some countries, there's something called a buy-on, which means the opening acts pay to actually be on the stage in uh, front of the headliner, which I think is awful and egregious, but that's, you know, just my take on it. Um, so from your vantage point, I think you have to look at, pick and choose the opportunities of when you're prepared to uh, look at free or less money because the opportunity is bigger, the audience is bigger, you're getting from a crowd that you never would otherwise, and those, you know, it, that may not be cash money, but it certainly has real uh, intrinsic value right. <laughs> in terms of your career. Um, but, you know, people start asking you a second time or a third time, you know, I, I, I do believe that, that artists are taken advantage of that way. And, you know, I don't feel comfortable with it. Like, I, I, I always want to see somebody being compensated, at least in some way, whether or not, um, you know, they're drawing an audience or not, because they're there to entertain the room, and the people are coming early, and they're drinking beer, and, you know, it's, it adds value to us, so it should also add value to the artist. Thank you so much. Oh, I think Vivian wanted to add something. No, I I was just basically, you know, because it happens and, you know, I get that question all the time, like, say, in my world, it's film and TV, like, oh, should I do it for free? And it's like, you can't eat free, you know? So, yes. Uh -oh. We've come to the end of the interview portion of the evening. Yay. Any closing thoughts, Lisa, to share? From, from you. Oh, from you. Thoughts. Um, well, I guess, show of hands, how many of you are artists? And how many of you are trying to get into the business side of things? So, okay. Well, the good news is most of you raised your hands for both, which is pretty much, you know, where the business is at today. Um, you know, we all have to look at the reality of a do-it-yourself model. And information, although sometimes uh, fake news information is more available to you than, you know, certainly when I was coming up in the business. Um, so, you know, a lot of people argue that an artistic right-brained person just, you know, isn't going to be the person that, you know, ultimately can handle the business side. The reality in the business today uh, is you just have to handle both and you have to um, you know, read and learn, and the N word again, networking um, is. You got to be careful with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we've said it now a dozen times, right? Like you, you, you can't necessarily, um, you know, know everything there is to learn, uh, but there's people you can reach out to. You're always sort of six degrees of separation from somebody that can give you insight. You know, there's people in this room. I can't see very far, but I see Yvonne and I see Karen. And, uh, you know, these are people that have decades of experience in this business and they're sitting two rows behind you. Um, you know, in journalism and booking, uh, like, we're going to spend a little bit of time, like, working the room. I want to see you guys, like, actually working the room. You don't necessarily know who these people are. 
go up, introduce yourself, at least say hello, say what it is that you do, ask them what they do, and have two questions for every one of them on anything you feel might be appropriate based on what they do. You know, we have Jackie Dean, who's the COO of Music Canada. Like, you know, she's, she's a legend and she's sitting three rows behind you. So uh, you have Athena, who I talked about earlier, who's in the back row, who runs the Opera House. I'm feeling really badly because I can't see much past that, but, um, you know, they, they, not everybody is a name tag right now, so you're going to have to, like, get out of your comfort zone and walk up to people and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, we're not actually supposed to shake hands, and you should have your mask back on when you do so, um, and just, you know, introduce yourself and, you know, ask a couple questions. I guarantee you're going to walk out of here with at least a few new contacts and some information uh, where that you can, you know, take your knowledge a step further. And I think what you said was so important, which is ask what they do so you know what their uh, area of expertise is, and then you ask them questions about that. Because I can't tell the amount of times I've been at a networking thing where people ask me about, like, the most radically different thing than, from, than what I do. And that shows that you're not listening, you're, you're just not tapped in, and I think that's definitely part of the exercise in a networking situation. Granted, in Canada, we're such a small community that everybody that's in this room that works in the business, we've all done a little bit of everything, so most of us can answer multifaceted questions, but certainly I think that was really good I, um, advice about asking what they do and, and then asking things that are pertinent specifically to that that will be helpful to you. Hey, Yvonne. This is Yvonne, everybody. She's a Hi, legend, Yvonne. too. She's a legend. I asked Yvonne what her title should be, and she said, queen of fucking everything. Because it is her title. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just like to point out that every artist should be going to support other artists. Go and see as much music as you can. You learn a lot by the performance, and you network with the people in the room. But please go out and see other musicians play. Yes, amazing. Great advice. Thanks, Lisa, so. thank you so thank you. much for doing this. I know it's, it's a rare one for you. Like you guys said, you're usually working at night. So the, the one silver lining of this pandemic has that we've all been able to connect in new and different ways with people and the things that they do. And we've just had to... Um, pivot, the word that we are so over right now. And, His favorite and, word. Yeah, I know. And figure it out. But I think what's come out of that and the blessings that have come out are things like this and being able to have these kind of conversations. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here for this part. Please do take advantage of this networking uh, part. Look forward to talking to you guys. Lisa's looking forward and everybody else that here. So amazing women uh, sitting right behind you. Please take advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa everybody.